it's wonderful to uh, have this opportunity to talk about the proposed change in consent laws in sexual assault cases. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the New South Wales government is about to barge through your bedroom doors. Despite the unique uh, quality of every individual relationship, sexual relationship between any two people, the New South Wales Attorney General is planning to criminalise sexual acts which do not conform to its new prescription. No matter how long an intimate relationship has endured, whether it's within marriage or outside of marriage, uh, whatever two people it's between, even two people who swear, both swear, that everything was consensual, uh, certain sexual acts will be criminalised if a government-imposed protocol of affirmative consent is not observed. The New South Wales Bar Association has, has uh, generally speaking, railed against judging sexual encounters according to a narrow and uh, artificial, really, understanding of relationships. Ladies and gentlemen, I've been working in the criminal law since 1986, including in hundreds of sexual assault cases. In fact, I, I joined the what became the Director of Public Prosecution's Office uh, just to prosecute child sexual assault cases because I knew from experience that child sexual assault could happen virtually under the uh, eyes of parents uh, and they wouldn't realise. And it was very clear that much of the community had no appreciation of the incidence of this crime uh, because... Uh, it most, uh, many such cases occurred in the 1960s, 1970s, when I'd been a child and an ad adolescent. I knew uh, something of it from, from bitter personal experience, and it was an area into which I uh, really wanted to go to even things up. Children were extremely disadvantaged uh, before the 1980s in courts of law. Children's evidence was not admissible unless it was corroborated. Uh, whereas women and other complainants in sexual assault cases don't suffer that disadvantage. Unsworn evidence was uh, not admissible and children often didn't have the knowledge or the capacity to convince a court that they understood the concept of an oath. Women and complainants, other complainants in sexual assault cases, in rape cases, do not suffer that impediment. With children in the 1980s, reform was necessary and it duly took place to allow children's evidence to be received and considered uh, as, as that of adults uh, is, is, was and is. Uh, but still for decades, child sexual assault cases were looked down upon uh, as though they were some kind of, they were being run by some sort of uh, women's auxiliary to the legal profession. And so many times uh, other lawyers would say to me, are you still doing those child sexual assault, those kiddie sex cases, kiddie sex cases. And that pejorative uh, expression really annoyed me for a very long time. I, I still bristle from it, uh, but uh, it, it became something that uh, everyone appreciates was it was so necessary. But e even by the time of the prosecution of uh, the notorious pedophile Dolly Dunn in the 1990s, I, I still had to persuade the court to accept the video evidence that Dunn himself had uh, collected of, of himself uh, sexually defiling his uh, unfortunate young victims. It was important that the undeniable fact uh, of the abuse became public through uh, the press uh, coverage of, of that case for the sake of the protection of children and the acceptance of the accounts uh, of victims within the wider community. There were sections of the community, even right up until that time, who just couldn't accept that some men, mostly men, uh, could behave that way toward children, and uh, that is now no longer the case. Uh, reform was necessary uh, in, in that area.
I was also the prosecutor over more than 30 years in, in uh, many sexual assault cases, many rape trials uh, where the, the uh, complainants were adults uh, or, or close to adulthood. <clears throat> rape, though, unlike child sexual assault, was not something with which jurors uh, and the public uh, was unfamiliar. Uh, it was a concept that was widely understood. Uh, in fact, I looked up my old copy of uh, the great feminist tome, Our Bodies, Ourselves, by the, uh, the Boston Women's Health Collective that I had had in 1976 uh, when I was uh, 17. And uh, in that uh, book, it, it's the, the concept of rape was as, as, it, as it was now, as it is now, uh, it, it was about uh, sexual intercourse uh, or any sexual act uh, that forced upon a woman against her will. So, so it, 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 this is very well understood. And uh, I, I don't recall prosecuting uh, any rape case in, in those decades uh, where there was not a conviction. But I do recall numerous cases which came into the office of the DPP where uh, upon an examination of the evidence, it was very clear that the complainant was wrong, uh, was mistaken uh, or couldn't be relied upon in some way. And it was then the task of prosecutors to uh, to speak to the director of public prosecutions to say that the, the evidence is not strong enough to discontinue the case, but there was a way to uh, convey that to a complainant so that there was not a sense of uh, terrible loss or disappointment, because uh, we, we saw the complainant as a person who, uh, well, the complainant was not the centre of the case. Uh, the complainant was a witness, uh, like everyone else. The, the case is not, a, a criminal case is not about uh, the complainant or victim, if, if it turns out to be the case. It's, that, that is not the centre of the case. The case is about the person who is charged. So, so th this could be conveyed to a complainant that, well, the evidence is not there at the moment. There may be evidence in, in the future that would other, other, other complainants may come forward about this particular person and the case can be uh, continued then. It's better not to proceed now without strong evidence uh, and then the case can be um, taken up at a later time. That, that was acceptable, but it seems not so much to be the case that that is done now. Uh, perhaps prosecutors don't have the stomach for conveying the, the, the uh, bad news, but it, it's, it was always better for a complainant to be told the truth about the strength of the case before it started than to conduct a case which inevitably resulted in a not guilty verdict and then the complainant uh, goes away feeling uh, as though she, she or he was not believed. This is my third year practicing uh, as a criminal defense counsel. And I have defended people accused of sexual intercourse without consent. The, the main lesson I've learned since, uh, since changing sides as it were, is that the prosecution has a scaffold of information provided by one side. And there's so much more uh, color uh, available from when, when, when one speaks then to, to have all, all the scaffolding filled in by the person who is uh, accused. And, and that's something that's not known uh, within the prosecution uh, uh, service. Uh, so, that, so criminal trials are not, not s civil cases. They're, they're not, uh, do we believe this one or that one? The, the, uh, the standard of proof beyond reasonable doubt uh, really makes it inappropriate to think of this as some kind of content test between uh, the complainant and the accused that has to be made even in some way. The charge uh, of rape, sexual intercourse without consent, knowing that the complainant is not consenting, is, is still, is, is while uh, certainly must, have, must be proved, of course, beyond reasonable doubt, um, 
the um, a jury is currently directed that the accused does not have to prove that the complainant consented. It's for the Crown to prove beyond reasonable doubt that, that uh, she or he did not. The presumption of innocence. If, uh, and, and a judge directs the jury, a person consents to sexual intercourse if she or he freely and voluntarily agrees to have sexual intercourse with another person. And the consent can be given verbally or expressed by actions. Similarly, absence of consent does not have to be in words. It may also be communicated in other ways, such as the offering of resistance, although this is not necessary as the law specifically provides that a person who does not offer actual physical resistance to sex is not, by reason only of that fact, to be regarded as consenting to the sexual intercourse. So there are, there are aspects of the jury directions now which, in effect, uh, advantage the prosecution. Uh, another example is that... Uh, the jury is told that a person does not consent if, if she or he does not have the opportunity to consent because uh, they're, they're asleep or unconscious uh, or have been very, very severely affected by alcohol or other drugs. Uh, but the jury is told that consent that is obtained after persuasion is still consent, provided that ultimately it is given freely and voluntarily. As to knowledge, the jury is directed that the Crown must prove beyond reasonable doubt that the accused knew the complainant did not consent. So the, the Crown must prove beyond reasonable doubt uh, one of two facts, either the, that the accused did not honestly believe that the complainant was consenting, or even if the accused did have an honest belief in consent, there, there were no reasonable grounds for believing that the complainant consented to the sex. So it's for the Crown to prove that the accused uh, had a guilty mind. It's not just the act, of course. Uh, it must eliminate any reasonable possibility that the accused did honestly believe on reasonable grounds that the complainant was consenting. And the jury is directed that it must take into account what steps were actually taken by the accused to ascertain whether the complainant was consenting. The Crown can also prove guilt by proving uh, beyond reasonable doubt, of course, either that the accused simply failed to consider whether uh, the complainant was consenting at all, or the accused realised the possibility that the complainant was not consenting, but went ahead regardless of whether there was consent or not. Uh, and a, an accused person who has voluntarily ingested alcohol or drugs cannot then use that to say, that he uh, couldn't make a proper make any evaluation because of his condition. So that so there there are uh, certain aspects of that that are quite advantageous to the prosecution, and no one is really coming out with this. But about a third of sexual assault cases in New South Wales do result in convictions, and that is for word against word cases, for, for cases where, unlike a bank robbery where there's closed circuit television or, or a murder case where there's DNA and uh, other physical or technological evidence, for word against word cases, that's a significant proportion. There is not, uh, uh, contrary to what might be said, there is not a, a, a terrible uh, lack of conviction in uh, cases which are run to trial. But uh, it, it was interesting to note what uh, Mr. Brett Walker SC said about uh, the proportion in effect of guilty verdicts. The more cases that are run and, and the less that the Director of Public Prosecutions uh, engages in any filtering process, the, uh, the, the fewer cases will result in conviction. So that if there has been any diminution in recent years, uh, it, it uh, is, uh, I, I would contend, because so many cases, so many weak cases that used to be filtered out in the proper uh, operation of the, uh, the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions are, are not being filtered out now. Uh, the consent law reform, th this was the announcement, 
uh, by the Attorney General. Sexual consent laws will be strengthened and simplified under New South Wales government reforms designed to protect victim survivors and educate the community. Uh, already there, we have an Attorney General uh, calling complainants in sexual uh, assault cases and uh, presumably he's talking about the ones that have not proceeded to, to conviction. But uh, the complainants are already victims. And this is, uh, an, uh, this is a very large step to take. We have to be careful about that terminology. The Attorney General, uh, Mr. Speakman, acknowledged the growing calls across the community for reforms to respond more effectively to the scourge of sexual violence in this country. We can send the message that survivors' calls for reform have been heard. The, the key reforms are a person does not consent to sexual activity and, and activity unless they said or did, it probably is they, now that we're changing uh, pronouns to plurals, they said or did something to communicate consent and an accused person's belief in consent will not be reasonable unless they said or did something to ascertain consent. So that there is some kind of... Uh, uh, expectation that everyone will be getting some kind of sign signal word uh, that consent is is taking place and it will have to be for every sexual act uh, which is embarked upon by the couple in question in in may 2018 the attorney general asked the new south wales law reform commission to review consent and so two and a half years later a report was published the government is supporting all 44 recommendations and will even go further by declaring that an accused person's belief in consent will not be reasonable unless they said or did something to ascertain consent. And the attorney says, this means we will have an affirmative model of consent which will address issues that have arisen in sexual offence trials about whether an accused's belief that consent existed was actually reasonable. The, uh, the um, advocacy groups for sexual assault uh, consider it a huge leap forward and a huge win for survivors. Uh, this is not just about holding perpetrators to account where there hasn't been communication, but changing social behaviour so the reforms will be accompanied by extensive community education. Uh, and Commissioner... Uh, Mick Fuller, police commissioner, said the police are committed to supporting victims. As police, our primary rule is to support victims who courageously come forward to police to report sexual assault. This is where we go off the track. There was even, a, before things used to hit the office of the director of public prosecutions, police had a filtering process too. They are no longer permitted to do that. I know that they are instructed by the commissioner now to refer in, in uh, facts sheets before there is any conviction of any person to any complainant in sexual assault as victims. And, to, and of course, to treat them accordingly. They, they, have no, they have very little discretion or none in proceeding to charge. And yet, uh, with ownership of the case, the police then uh, want, want the case to succeed. But uh, once, the, once the complainant has been declared a victim or regarded as a victim, there's not much more uh, investigation that goes on. There's just a, a zeal to get to the end and to convict the charged person. The Attorney General says, we know from all the stats that we've quoted this week the biggest problem here is not false complaints, which are typically few and far between. It's under-reporting. Uh, well, it's, it's difficult to know about under-reporting because uh, how can anyone know that? And to say that false complaints are typically few and far between uh, is, is not consistent with even my experience uh, within the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions. Not necessarily uh, people who are mendacious, but people who may not be able to remember what happened or for some other reason have uh, got the wrong idea. Uh, 
Uh, the Attorney General even then made the extraordinary pronouncement, the fact that someone is acquitted or not further investigated doesn't mean it didn't happen. Uh, presumption of innocence, anyone? H how can anyone say it happened if, if, uh, the, if there has been no inquiry by the usual standards? Uh, the, the criminal trial is, as I say, about the person who is charged. It's not meant to be a, for it's, it's not a social work forum or a, a psychology uh, convention. It's not there to provide the complainant with some kind of uh, solace or affirmation or uh, tremendous triumph. It's, it's not about the complainant. There may be other things about the complainant, but uh, as one has to say to juries now as a defence counsel, uh, you, it, it is very nice and and a, and a lovely kind thing to believe your child or your neighbour or your friend if he or she says that they've been sexually assaulted. It's that's a very good thing. Believe them, but a jury uh, has to act judicially, and and a jury can't be and and it's it doesn't work if police get into courts and start talking about victims. The victim did this and the victim did that. The, the, the court is not about uh, believing victims. And uh, so, so we are really blurring lines here. And men, all men, and mothers and sisters and friends of men uh, ought to be very concerned because what wasn't rape last year maybe rape next year if if the purpose of these reforms is simply to increase the numbers of people who are uh, convicted of rape so and in the end it's still a word against word proposition ladies and gentlemen it's still it will still be in a trial uh, but i asked her and she said yes and so, so it doesn't really shift anything uh, but what it does is, is put um, ridiculous expectations on uh, intimate relations where, uh, as we all know, uh, uh, people work things out for themselves. And, and it, it's not as though these things can't come against people years later when things aren't so cosy. We can't have greater fairness for complainants without compromising the rights of accused persons. Now, it's the accused whose liberty is at stake in a criminal trial. It is he, generally he, who's been arrested and thrown into custody uh, until bail can be sought, who's had his home raided and searched by police. And this is happening with sexual assault cases all the time, who's had to pledge his life savings or, or have his parents mortgage their house to get for, for legal fees and whose life is on hold for two or three years. The, the Bar Association has said that the changes uh, were likely to result in significant injustice and could criminalise many consensual sexual relations. That's from uh, Stephen Odges, SC, who's the chair of the Criminal Law Committee. Uh, but as against that, uh, we've, we have uh, another group of barristers, a much smaller group, not criminal lawyers, although one, I think, was uh, counsel assisting in ICAC when Mr Gallagher's case was on. Uh, who, who have uh, said, among other things, recent years have confirmed that the current balance struck by sexual assault laws is not satisfactory. Well, it's not about a balance between the complainant and the accused, and it can't be. Uh, something needs to be done. Is, is, have you ever heard such, uh, such something so far from a legal analysis by a group of bar barristers, something needs to be done, they, they stamp their feet. Uh, so even in the old days, um, uh, non it, lawyers would never speak in this uh, ridiculous fashion. Uh, we, we must remember the principles. Um, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, the Criminal law is a blunt and brutal tool of social education, as Mr. Rogers said. A desire to bring about societal change must not be at the expense of criminalising behaviour that does not involve serious misconduct or deserve severe punishment.
we must be careful about what we're doing uh, to criminal trials and uh, we must maintain uh, the presumption of innocence and the uh, current uh, rules and regulations do that uh, most adequately.